Apple had never done anything this massive before. And that's when Bill turned to Steve and said, Steve, this is going to be bigger than the Mac. And Steve said, I know. And we looked around, and we noticed that almost everyone around us had phones. And everyone was complaining about their phones. And we thought, could we build something better? You know, it's a roller coaster ride. And if it ain't scary, it ain't fun. The iPod was selling, it was selling better and better. It was probably 50% of our sales around this time. And so we kept asking ourselves, what, is, what concerns do we have about the iPod success long term? What will cannibalize iPod sales? And one of the biggest concerns was cell phones. First, we were making the iPod plus phone with a, you, you can say in a way, a hardware keyboard because it was using the interface of the iPod. Well, we tried, I think, 30, 40 different ways of making the wheel not become a old rotary phone dial, right? And nothing seemed logical or intuitive. And so at the end of the day, you couldn't, you could select from a list, right? That was what the iPod was all about. But then to actually dial a real number, it was so cumbersome, it was like, this is never gonna work. And I remember one day sitting at lunch with Steve and, and he and I both had our phones out. And Steve said, you know that technology we're building to do touch for the tablet? Could we shrink that down into something the size of something that could fit in your pocket and make a phone out of that technology? Steve goes, come over here, I need to show you something. I said, sure, show me something. And so he walked me into the room and uh, he goes, it was basically like a ping pong table sized demo with a projector that was projecting a Mac interface on it. And he was like, check this out. It was, and you would use your whole hand and you could touch different things like it was a big, big Mac. And he's like, look at that, wow, bap, bap, bap. And I can do two, and I can do three, and I can do it, and I can do it. I'm like, let's get all around it and do it. And it was literally a ping pong sized multi-touch display. And he goes, I think this is gonna solve our problem. There was a time in 2005, I think it was, uh, that we'd been doing a lot of designs, but the designs weren't quite there yet. It just, it didn't feel complete. And Steve came to one of our design meetings and he said, this isn't good enough. Like, this is it. You have to come up with something so much better, this is not good enough. He didn't have to read tea leaves. I mean, he said, if you don't start showing me something good soon, I'm gonna give the project to another team. And he said, you have two weeks. And so we went back and Greg assigned different uh, specific ownership of different pieces of the design to different people. And that team worked 168 hours a week for two weeks. I mean, they just, they never stopped. When they did stop, Greg got them a hotel room across the road so they wouldn't have to drive home if they lived in San Francisco. And at the end of those two weeks, I remember looking at this thing and thinking, this, this is phenomenal. Like, this is it. Like, we have cracked it. The first time he, he saw it, he was completely silent. He didn't say a thing. He didn't say a thing, he didn't gesture, he didn't ask a question. And then he sat back and said, show it to me again. And so we go through again, we go through the whole thing again. You know, Steve was pretty much blown away by the demonstration. It was great work. Our reward for doing a great job on that demonstration was to you know, kill ourselves over the next two and a half years. The biggest science project of the entire endeavor, I think, for software was the soft keyboard. We, we knew we'd be able to create a keyboard, but we knew we'd be compared against the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry was the most popular smartphone out at the time. It was called the CrackBerry, right? We hadn't seen multi-touch in action, right? Was multi-touch touchscreen actually going to deliver a good enough? And how good is good enough compared to this keyboard, this CrackBerry keyboard? You know, we're bringing up a whole vocabulary. We're bringing up a visual vocabulary, what the touch interactions would be like. Pinch to zoom and the scrolling behavior with the, you know, we call it rubber banding, the bounce at the end of a scroll to indicate you're at the end of the list. It was all new. I remember we got somewhere in, 
I think it was early 2006, and I could see the light at the end of the tunnel for, for the iPhone OS. I could see when it was gonna ship. The keyboard wasn't there. Its accuracy was poor. Uh, it was just, it was hard to use. If you wanted to write an email, you'd give up. And so I went and I froze all development on all applications. And every UI developer at this point moved over and I said, we're gonna spend a few weeks and everyone's building keyboards. And at the end of, you know, let's say three weeks, we all got together in a conference room and everyone got up and started demoing the keyboards they'd created. And some of these were just crazy. I mean, you'd, you'd do these gestures, these super complex gestures that were really hard to learn. And one guy came in with his keyboard and it looked like a natural QWERTY keyboard. It's the kind of keyboard you use on your computer. It looked just like that. You started to use it and it worked amazingly well. It was so accurate, which was completely different from the one we had three weeks earlier that looked similar but didn't work at all. So we started digging into what did you do? And there are all these techniques you use, AI techniques and others, to figure out what you're trying to type. So if you type the letter T, there's a high probability you're going to type H next. The is a common word. So the H button would stay the same physical size to your eye, but the hit region would grow. And so when you went toward the H, you're probably going to hit the H now. And now the E is probably huge as a hit region, and you're going to hit the E. It would figure these things out. We have all these teams learning in parallel, right? We had to have an antenna. And so we all made a, like a 1.0 prototype phone. And we're like, if we would have known what we know now, back when we were making this prototype, we would have done this differently and this differently and this differently. And we're like, OK, blow it up. Now let's build the real one. And that's what was shipped. We were given, you know, OK, the screen's going to be this big, right? And then we were given plastic prototypes of the touch screen technology, we knew the general form factor, but it was a while before we saw anything approaching final industrial design. Just as we weren't seeing the hardware at the time, the team working on the hardware wasn't allowed to see the software at the time. I mean, it was very compartmentalized. We put a poster up on the wall that was the poster of Fight Club. First rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. First rule about the Purple Project, that was the code name, was you don't talk about the Purple Project. I can't speak to the efficiency, but I can tell you that it worked because not one person knew what iPhone was going to look like right before that keynote. People thought they knew that Apple was doing a phone, but nobody knew what they were going to see that day in January at the keynote. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And we are calling it iPhone. We demoed almost every feature. We played music. We took calls during music. We, we went to really large and complex websites. I mean, it was, it was a major real demo. And everything was live. Uh, so I sat there just sweating the whole time. <laughs> I was so nervous about it. When you run into bugs today, that's because it's been worked out. Like then it's just the first time. Like you're, and you would go, okay, press this one now. Wait two seconds, press this now. But it was so choreographed. If you went off the script, it could, right? So you had to make sure when the demoers knew exactly what they were supposed to do at which time. You do a great demo at Macworld Expo. The people in the audience are either media, Apple employees, or people who would pay money to like go to this conference about you know the products of their favorite computer company. It's pretty industry specific. The fact that you saw people in lines around stores or lines stretching into parking lots at not just Apple stores, but at every AT&T store was, in retrospect, it's really the first inkling that this is going to have a broader societal impact rather than just being the best phone ever.